congregation, please rise. Thank you, brothers and sisters. You may be seated. Welcome to the funeral services of Brother Eugene George Orr. I am Bishop Eric Acton, and I'll be conducting today's meetings. In behalf of the family, we would like to thank all those who have expressed love and kindness visited, well wishes, food, 
and assistance in organizing the proceedings today. I'd like to thank the Relief Society for helping so much in, in these programs and organization. And we'd like to recognize Sister Laws at the organ for her service today. Our opening hymn will be, I Need Thee Every Hour. It will be performed by the Lisa or Howe family, Eugene and Claudia's daughter, accompanied by Sister Kylie Pemberton, and son-in-law Quinn Howe will provide an invocation. Please proceed.
Our dear Heavenly Father, as we meet for the funeral services of Eugene George Orr, we are very grateful for the privilege that we've had to know him. We're grateful for the kindness that he demonstrated all down here on this earth and the loving hands that he had to help all those who were around him. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to meet in such a wonderful place and we're grateful for all the blessings which we enjoy as members of the church and having thy gospel. We ask you to please bless those who are speaking today, that they'll be able to share their thoughts and, and be able to say the things that they prepared and the things that they feel. And we ask you to please watch over all of the family that that they'll be able to feel the love and the peace that, that they need. And these things we say in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. program will go as outlined today. Life History by daughter-in-law Kari Orr, followed by son Damon Orr, who will speak to us. We'll then have a musical performance, How Great Thou Art, performed by daughter-in-law Cody Orr and granddaughters Brianne Palmer and Megan Orr accompanied by Sister Melanie Holliday. Following the musical number, we will hear from daughter JoLynn Orr. Our next speaker will be daughter Lisa Orr Howe, followed by musical number Amazing Grace, performed by Julie Orr Lacero and her family, accompanied by Sister Melanie Holliday. Following the musical number, we will hear from son Larry Orr, followed by son Jeff Orr. We'll then be pleased to hear, I am a child of God, performed by grandchildren and great-grandchildren, accompanied by sister Kylie Pemberton. We will proceed to that point. Thank you. Claudia for giving me the privilege to do the life history of Eugene George Orr. He was born in Craig, Colorado on May 21st, 1938 to Harry Flavius and Ruba Lichtenhahn Orr. He was the youngest of five children. He had two brothers, Wayne and John, and two sisters, Dorothy and Ada, all of which had moved away while he moved away while he was still very young. Some of the information that I've taken from this, this history was written by Jean at the urging of Claudia several years ago, and I'm so grateful that we have that information written in his own hand. 
Jean started school in Axel, Axel, Colorado. There were 16 children in eight grades in his school. He and one other child in the first grade. In the second grade, his teach, one of his teachers was Mrs. Cox. And this was the, the mother of his best friend, Roy. And he said that one day, um, at lunchtime, um, they didn't come back. They went out to, and they didn't come back until school was out. When they got back, Mrs. Cox said, asked them where they'd been, obviously, and he told her that they'd been out playing in the rocks, and they didn't hear the lunch bell ring. And he said, when she got through with us, we could hear the bell ring a mile away. <laughs> That's very characteristic of Grandpa Orr. He always wanted to make everybody laugh and smile. That's one of the things that we'll all remember about him. In 1948, when he was in the fifth grade, his mom and dad purchased two acres three miles outside of the town of Craig. Oh, I'm sorry, the town of Axel. And the little town there, oh, I'm getting this all mixed up, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, the town of Axel, where he was when, for, in first grade, had two general stores and, and two rental houses in between them. There were no modern conveniences in this community. That means no plumbing and no running water, no electricity. Um, during the summer, they lived on this homestead, um, and they had lots of animals to take, take care of that kept them really busy. In, when, in 1948, and when he was in the fifth grade, they moved um, to, his parents purchased two acres of land on a road um, outside of Axel. He said that his mom basically built the house on the property with a little help from him part time. Um, Gene, during his freshman year in high school, um, he got a job at a service station. And he worked there from 3.30 to 7 each night and from 7 o'clock to 5 on Saturdays. He earned 25 cents an hour. Um, he'd continue to um, go to high school and um, In, the, in this, he got that job the year he started high school. And during his high school, he took welding, agriculture, mechanics, carpentry, and other classes pertaining to farming because he always thought that he was going to be a farmer. In the evenings, he still worked at the service station, but by now he was making minimum wage, a whopping 67 cents an hour. And he also still had many chores to do but there not, were not as many chores as when they lived on the homestead. He said when he lived on the homestead, I want to read this part to you. Um, he said, Mom and I always had to do all of the chores. We had about 200 head of sheep, several cows, and some bum lambs to raise. We were always raised a big garden, and the water from the garden was diverted out of the creek and into a ditch about an eighth, eighth of a mile above the garden. Mom and all, I always had to clean out the ditch in the spring. Sometimes dad would be there to help. He said, I really hated that job of planting the garden. I can remember sitting and shelling peas for what seemed like hours during summer afternoons. Um, his life growing up was hard and very difficult, different than what, what we enjoy and what he helped to provide for his family. Um, after Gene graduated from high school on his birthday in 1956, he worked for a, a year, about a year around the Craig area at several different jobs. When he was laid off from a uranium mill in Maybell, Colorado, 
he decided to come to Monticello to visit his brother John and his wife. Um, when he went to their house, they weren't home, and he went to a cafe to get some dinner, and a man came in and asked if anybody needed a job, and we all know he was a hard worker, and he said he did, and he um, was hired on the spot. And during the time that he lived in Monticello, he met Claudia Shumway, and they were married in 1958. To this union were born seven children, Jeffrey Dale, Julie Ray, Larry Eugene, Lisa Jolin, Kevin Shumway, and Damon Shumway. Around this time, Jean joined the Army and spent three years stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. He served three years there, um, and he served one-year positions in, as a company clerk, cook's helper, and an ammunition guard. When Jean's three years were up, they returned with their family to Blanding, Utah. Jean worked at many jobs. We all know what a hard worker he was. But the last two jobs where he worked were as a meat cutter at Clark's Market and at the Boss Butte Apartments. Jean joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when he was 12 years old. He had a strong testimony and served faithfully in many callings, including at the Indian Branch, Stake Missionary in Anathan, Montezuma Creek, the high priest group in the high priest group leadership as an assistant scoutmaster with Steve Lovell, a ward mission leader and gospel principles teacher, and in the branch presidency at White Mesa, and served many years as a faithful minister and home teacher. Claudia told me that the best investment she and Jean ever made was a, night, a green 1942 Willie's Jeep that looked as if it had been through the war. Their family spent thousands of hours camping and jeeping with Mary and Ollie Black's family, the Karchners and others. Claudia and Jean also spent many enjoyable evenings playing pinochle and eating popcorn with Mary and Ollie before Ollie's death. One of the hardest things that Jean ever endured was losing of his son, Kevin, in 2006. And today is the anniversary of his death. And I believe with all my heart that they're having a wonderful reunion. Jean was an accomplished cook and enjoyed cooking for family and friends. Well, some of my favorites are the yummy pot roast and Dutch oven potatoes that he cooked. But I think our family favorite is the biscuits and most delicious biscuits and gravy that he made without ever using a recipe. Jean could cook, fix anything from a chainsaw to a transmission and everything in between. Jean was a friend to all, and because he was so friendly and kind, it was no surprise that he was chosen as Blanding Citizen of the Year in 1989, and he was very honored to receive that award. Gene enjoyed spending time with his family, his seven children, 25 grandchildren, and 32 great-grandchildren, and counting. He loved to be, they all loved to be around him and loved hearing his stories and funny jokes. I am personally grateful for the love and kindness that he has always shown me and my family. Whoever was with him, he always made it feel like we were his favorite. He will be sorely missed, and I love him very much. Say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the uh, youngest child, I was told I had to go first. Do a, to do a talk and I am honored to be able to stand up here and, and give a talk and mention a few things about my dad. Um, he told me a few weeks ago when we were out getting wood that uh, that he hopes it's a, a fast funeral and people laugh and well he just mostly stressed that it was fast. <laughs> um, a couple things that I want to mention about my dad 
um, growing up was was like Carrie mentioned several times about him being a hard worker. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that worked as hard as he did. He was usually gone from sun up to well past sundown to make sure that his family is, was taken care of. He always did it with a great attitude. Um, I've had several friends reach out to me over the last few days and and tell me that uh, the thing they remember was always being able to come to work with me and him, him treating them as if if they were one of his kids too. If, if we were playing a joke on one another, he would join in and and uh, go on with the joke and, and help out with it. And my friends really appreciated that side of him. Um, I loved working with him, especially on Saturday mornings, because usually we would go to, it's, it's Jack's Cafe now, I can't remember what it was called before it was Jack's, but that was our routine. Me and Kevin and, and my dad would, would go do that before we'd go to work. Or often we would head down to the grocery store and stock up on a lot of food on, on Saturday. And, and we enjoyed doing that because, and, and that usually took a few hours because every single person that my dad ran into, he would have to stop and, and visit with. And um, the one thing that Kevin and I liked about that was we could throw a few things into the shopping cart and he wouldn't even notice because he was, he was busy talking. Uh, to this to this day, I've seen him in the grocery store a few times, and, and he was always talking to somebody visiting, and he always had a smile. Um, people loved him down there when he when he worked there, and he would also make them breakfast, you know, at the store too. Um, Christmas lights. We uh, we used to. Uh, Hey, Christmas lights every year, and it had to be bigger and better than the year before. Um, funny thing is, you know, with us having a having a pottery shop, uh, we would win pottery bowls from uh, Cedar Mesa Pottery for having the best lights. <laughs> Same with floats on the Fourth of July. We won several first place floats and pottery bowls from Cedar Mesa Pottery. <laughs> um, Another thing that uh, that actually my dad and Kevin taught me was to uh, never get upset at my mom or yell at my mom. Kevin did that once, and my dad came home and uh, gave him the spanked him with a belt behind the the chicken coop. So I, I learned at an early age to that it's good to have a twin to to help you with uh, with with learning a life lesson. Um, one of the very first times and very few times that I ever heard my dad swear was the first time was we were uh, pour, or making, making frames for to pour the sidewalk out front of our house and uh, he was pounding in a, a stake and slipped and hit his thumb and, and Kevin and I just thought that was the funniest thing in the world and, <laughs> and my dad swore at us for laughing and we we were so shocked that uh, we we definitely stopped laughing <laughs> but the thing I'll always remember about my dad is you could never walk up to him and the second he sees you he would get the biggest smile on his face um, he loved people and people loved him <sighs> so thankful to, to have somebody like that I'm getting a spam phone call right now. Uh, I just like to, I know my dad and Kevin are, had a great reunion, and today they're sitting there watching us and laughing and having a great time. I, I, know, I know Kevin was thrilled to have my dad to be with him now, and, and I know they're going to do great together and spread the gospel. Uh, I love my dad very much. I end this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
it is to be able to talk about my dad today. Um, so when I was little, I loved to go to work with my dad. And he was always so good to take me. I remember when I had to have only been three, maybe four years old, um, he had a job and he'd have to go up on the mountain and something to do with the water system and blending. And he, um, the guy he worked with, Ron Kennedy, would come and pick him up in the morning. My dad would pack me up and they'd go and they'd set me. My dad had made a booster chair to go in the middle of them so I could see out the window. And so while we were traveling, I would remember singing songs, you know, and just chatting and just having a good time with these two. And I remember when they would stop for a job, my dad would get me out of the truck, set me on a rock, give me a treat and a toy and to keep me busy, and I'm sure I had to be an absolute mess. So when, but when they would finish the job, either Ron or my dad would pick me up, put me back in the chair, and off we would go again. And I just, you know, it was just something I always remembered. And I remember on the days that he didn't take me to work. I was always so excited when he'd come home and I'd always sing the song. I'm so dad, glad when daddy comes home. Glad as I can be, I clap my hands and shout for joy and climb up on his knee. Put my arms around his neck and hug him just like this. Pat his cheek and give him what? A great big kiss. Well, he disappeared when, here a couple of weeks ago, well, it's probably been a couple of months ago, he disappeared and I was looking all over for him, couldn't find him, come to find out he'd gone down to Ace Hardware to get something, and when he walked in, I just couldn't resist. I just started singing, I'm so glad when Daddy comes home, and he thought that was pretty darn funny. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to do that for him. And I don't know why I'm trying to look at this, because it's all a big blur, I really can't see it. <laughs> um, about two years ago, my mom decided that she wanted 
to get the old Bronco that they had fixed fixed up and painted and looking nice so you know we could have go for drives and stuff over the mountain and have to realize this Bronco had been sitting there for years so it was in pretty bad shape but me and my dad decided to take this project on and that summer he started taking things apart he pretty much took the whole thing apart by himself and I don't know that that was necessarily a good thing because we had piles here, piles here, and a bucket full of bolts. I had no idea where anything went. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a fun project. I, I really enjoyed doing that with him. Um, my dad asked my mom one time, well, this was going on. She, he asked her what she would like for Christmas. And my mom said, a ride down Main Street in the Bronco. Well, we knew the Bronco wasn't going to be done in time. You know, so, but how do you fulfill that wish? Well, I decided that I was going to go pick him up in the morning and take him for a ride. So I went up to their house, 3 o'clock in the morning, woke him up. And waking little old people up from a sound sleep is not a good thing to do. <laughs> Especially 3 a.m. Anyhow, we got my mom all bundled up, made sure she was warm. We went out, we climbed in the Bronco, and you have to realize, no lights, um, no seats nothing in this Bronco. Steering wheel and an ignition switch that was hanging down so you could start it. So we get in the Bronco. We're freezing. Oh, and I also had to tell my dad he had to sit behind me and hold the... Um, I had gotten a five-gallon bucket to sit on and I told him he was going to have to sit behind me and hold that because I couldn't push the clutch in because I didn't have leverage. So we drive down Main Street, turn around at Damon and Cody's house, and there's Cody standing out there with her camera so she could get a picture of this. <laughs> we get back home, go in the house where it's warm because, oh, it was bitter cold. But you know, that was a very fun experience and one I will never forget. And I would probably do it again if that's what she requested. <laughs> My dad was a, we've all said my dad's a very hard worker. And I was, I was, I have been very privileged this past year and a half, especially to be with him and the things he taught me. He was working down at the apartments and it got to the point he really needed a lot of help, but he taught me how to fix a leaky water heater, change a heating element on a dryer, fix faucets. I got to mow the lawn. I got to shovel snow. And honestly, I was very grateful when he quit working. <laughs> um, the, last, the last month of his life, I had the privilege of going up every morning and helping him put his compression socks on and his shoes, you know, getting him ready for the day, making sure he was okay, and listening to his stories. Some of them were funny, most of them were pretty corny, but that, that was just my dad. Um, about a week ago, we were talking about things. Oh, I've got, oh, I've got to mention that, and a bunch of other stuff that he taught me. I can sharpen a chainsaw, chain, I can lengthen it, I can shorten it. I can even start, I can even start them now. He taught me how to 
overhaul small engine carburetors, and it was always a thrill when the tiller or the lawnmower would start. He taught me how to take, or how to repair spring, the sprinkling system, how to run the sprinkling system, how to prepare it for winter. So many, my dad taught me so, so many things. Here, about a week ago, we were talking, and he said, you know, I was voted least likely to succeed in high school. And I looked at him, and I looked around, and I said, Dad, but you're successful. And he said, what do you mean? I said, Dad, you've been married for 62 years. You had your own business. You raised seven kids. You have a beautiful home, and everyone loves you. He said, Dad, you're the most successful person I know. And he said, do you really think so? I said, yes, Dad, I do. A little while later, he was telling me that he always wanted to be a pilot, but just never got the chance. He said he just, you know, there just wasn't time, there wasn't money, but it was just the one regret in his life he had is that he never became a pilot. And all I can say to that is, it's your turn to soar, Dad. I can say the same thing. That's a tough act to follow. I loved thinking of the different things that my dad taught me, the same things, but it was so long ago I don't remember now. But as I was thinking about the memories and all the experiences that I've had throughout my life, I am so grateful to have had parents that I, the ones that I was born into. One scripture that has always meant a lot to me is 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat after the learning of my father. And every single time that I started that, and I can't even tell you how many hundreds of times it was, I thought of my own parents and the gratitude that I have to have them as parents. They couldn't be any better. And I have to say parents because my mom and dad worked together in everything and what they taught us. One of the first things that I remember being taught is prayer. I am so grateful to have been taught prayer. And this morning I was down, I was at my shop and looking at the Bronco and had this memory of years and years and years ago, me and JoLynn and Kevin and Damon had gone out shooting, and I can't remember if it was Cottonwood or, what's the other place out there? Comwash, I don't, I don't know, remember which one. But we were following the road, and all of a sudden the Bronco stopped. And we're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what are we going to do? Because there's no phones, there's no people, there's nothing. And it started and we went a little ways further and then it stopped again. And at this time we were probably all a little bit scared and we decided to pray. And I don't remember if we tried to go again or if everybody just went and followed the road down a little ways but when we got to where the road went down to the wash it wasn't there and had we not had our vehicle die on us I believe three times we would have gone over the edge and there wasn't a top and there wasn't seat belts 
And I don't know what the end result would have been, but I'm pretty sure we had all been seriously injured or killed. And I've always been so grateful that I have prayer to rely on in all of the situations I've had in my life. My dad taught me to smile, and as much as Morgan's been smiling at me right now, and in the just previously, I assume I have not been smiling, and so every time I, I think, I, I try to put a smile on my face because I know my dad is smiling. He smiled no matter what. None of us know the extent of the pain that he has been in. He always said he wasn't in any. But I talked with one of my cousins, and she shared with me that she had a similar situation to him, and it was the most painful thing she's ever gone through. And she only had five jars taken out, or three jars taken out of her where he had five of blood out of his stomach. Whenever I walked in the house or anywhere and I'd say, how are you doing, Dad? He would always answer with, fantastic. And I really appreciate that because he knows that I needed to hear those words. One of the great joys in my life that I have a memory of is all of our camping and jeeping trips. We had so much fun. And when I think back, I, my dad would be, I mean, we had such a huge amount of people on our little Willie's Jeep. It really was the best investment that was made. And I don't know how we all fit on there, but there were usually 10 to 12 or 14 people all piled around and when he would be driving down the road and he would see a little bump in the road he would speed up so that we'd all just fly up and I remember just about losing someone once and we were all grabbing on to him or if he came to a stream he would go as fast as he could to it so that we'd all get wet we just had a lot of fun and he did teach us to work I'm grateful for those teachings and I hope that I've passed them on to my own kids. And he did have a great love for cooking, and he taught me how to make fried chicken in a Dutch oven, and I was able to cook the nightly meal at girls camp when we had our testimony meeting and the bishopric came, and. I was so proud that I could cook that meal for everybody, but it was because my dad had taught me. My dad, through example, taught us to find good in everybody and everything. He always had that grin on his face, and he told me one day that he just wanted people to wonder what he was up to. <laughs> he just, he just, he was silly. His jokes were so silly, like Jolene said. And um, he just wanted people to laugh. And what I really appreciate about him is every joke he told me could be repeated. I never heard anything contrary come out of his mouth. The last lesson that he taught his family was the night before he passed on. We knew there would only be a few hours left, so we gathered as much family as we could to say their goodbyes. There were several small grandchildren, and it was a little noisy, but he loved them, and he talked to them, and he hugged each one. He didn't send them away. This example of the importance of family will forever be etched in my mind and my heart. And I hope that I can treat my grandkids a little bit better and let them know how much I love them. When he, when he was laying there, like I said, we don't know what pain he was in, 
but he would reach out from the bed to hug each one of them. And I was just, I was just so grateful. My dad loved poetry and was forever saying poems. I could not believe what he could remember. It was, it was just crazy. And I want to end with some words of a song that I've been playing for the last few months as I knew the time was ending for my father to be here with me on this earth. And I played it every morning and all day long and several times, but I still did not memorize it, so I'm going to read it. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithfully will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways lead to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God hath undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let no thing shake. And now my mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. His voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, when the dearest friends depart. And all is darkened and the veil of tears. Then shalt thou better know his love, his heart, who comes to soothe thy sorrow and thy fears. Be still, my soul, thy Jesus can repay. From his own fullness all he takes away. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear, or fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joy restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. Be still, my soul, begin the song of praise, on earth believing, to the Lord on high, Acknowledge him in all thy words and ways, so shall he view thee with well-pleased eye. Be still, my soul, the sun of life divine, through passing clouds shall but more brightly shine. I would like to end, I guess, with the greatest thing that I have learned from my father, and that is that we have been taught about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and I know that he lives, and I know that through him we'll all live again. I love everything that I've been taught, and I'm so grateful, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's indeed a privilege to stand here today. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just so anxious to talk, I guess. But.
conducting a meeting and uh, this, there's a speaker that uh, had gone way over time and so I had to tug on his coattails and tell him it's time to sit down. So it's come about, come, come back around on me, but that's okay. That's, uh, as Damon said, I'm sure dad wants to have an enjoyable uh, uh, memory here with us. I've had the opportunity of knowing my dad for almost close to six decades. And when I got the call um, earlier this week, Jeff told me that I needed to speak for 50 minutes. And I said, oh, 50, that's all? Uh, I was in really poor cell reception. and. Uh, so I thought, oh, 50, that's no problem. I can do that real easy. And he said, he was very quick to clarify, no, five minutes. Repeated that several times, five minutes. And again, you know, six decades of knowing somebody, you can't sum it up in five minutes. It's impossible. You cannot give credit to somebody as wonderful as, as somebody as, as who our father was. When I was discussing with Nyla all the things I could say, 
I just mentioned several different things, and she says, okay, you've already got 15, 20, 30 minutes of talk right there. You're going to have to cut it back. And so I thought the rest of this week, okay, what, what message could I leave with you that would, would give you a better insight of, of who our Father was? And it's just like I've been drawing a blank this whole time. Um, but each one of my siblings at this point in time, the, the general gist has seemed to be that he taught. He was a teacher. He taught all of us different, different things. Now, Damon referred to a time that they heard Dad swear a couple times. Well, you know, he probably would have been swearing a lot more from that, but I actually taught him not to swear. When I started working with him, I charged him a quarter every time I heard him cuss. And he paid me. And I found out that uh, I could make more money following him around than doing the actual work. And uh, I think he finally figured that out, that he learned to just not talk so much. And uh, so my, my revenue stopped at that point in time. I had to go back and put the work on the cars. Uh, so even older people can be taught. There were so many experiences. Uh, I had the opportunity of working full time with him for over 20 years, part time almost 30, or 30 years total. He started, started work, working me in the body shop about eight, when I was about eight years old. I, I called it forced labor because I did not want to go there and sand cars and work on cars. I had no interest in that at the time. And, uh, but we, apparently he, him, and, or him and my mom decided that uh, Jeff and I needed to either be separated or hard at work just to keep the peace in the family or peace among ourselves. Right? It was like fighting like two cats in a gunny sack until he went on his mission and, and then when he came home I was actually in the MTC so we had a four year space to kind of cool things out there and, and that worked out great. Dad, and another thing that Damon mentioned is all the food that he got. Well, we end up with a tow truck when we were, had the body shop, and every time, uh, one of the things Dad taught me was uh, one of the basic food groups in life, and that consisted of uh, chocolate milk, those w little white gem donuts, and some pork rinds, and that was the basic food groups. Every time we went out on tows, um, or in recoveries of vehicles, he would al we'd always stop at the store, and those were the three main ingredients of, of uh, that food group that we'd purchase. And uh, sometimes we'd throw pop and candy bars in there too. Uh, if it was a real, if it was going to be a longer trip, he'd throw in the uh, chicken strips. But uh, he he wanted to make sure if we went out of town that we weren't going to starve to death. Uh, camping was also mentioned. Jeep trips. There was one particular trip. We made several trips to the Hole in the Rock. I have no idea how many family outings we went there with other families. Well, when I was a teenager, and as you, some of you teenagers are, are right now, and, and as you've been teenagers, you know at that age, you know everything there is to know about life. And of course, I was one of those. I, there was no exception. I was extremely intelligent. And um, one of the things when my dad was working for the water district, he used to have to go up to uh, past Johnson Creek over in Indian Creek and, and blow the beaver dams that would block the water that, uh, that was uh, supplying landing. So I, I learned as a teenager how to uh, set charges and that was really exciting. You know, you're 16 years old, you know how to set charges and watch things blow up and, you know, sticks and trees and everything go 100, 200 yards in the air. That's, that, that's living the dream. But uh, anyway, on one particular trip to the Hole in the Rock, I decided to take some black powder with us because I was going to put on a uh, spectacular show for all the camping participants later that evening. I believe it was probably about 11 o'clock midnight. Uh, one night we were in a place called Marble Camp and uh, I was up on the cliff there. The whole camp had gone to sleep and uh, I was with the, uh, some of the other rebellious teens, kind of what you'd probably think of the Sons of Messiah at that time. Uh, we were about 100 yards away from the rest of the camp and anyway, I climbed up on the, on the ledge there and and I set the, this is black powder, so it wasn't real explosive, but anyway, it sure, flame, sure puts out a big, big ball of flame. And anyway, the sparks uh, ignited the powder before I was ready, and it, uh, I thought it blew me off the cliff there, because I remember coming to him, patting my hair on, out, because it was on fire. But later in contemplation, I thought, no, nope. that was one of my guardian angels. He was really chapped. I mean, he booted me right off there, because there's no way that I could have gotten 
blown off of there. And so, anyway, I, I was successful in waking up the camp, and uh, my my friends uh, took me up to the main camp there. And of course, it was in a little bit of an uproar, and and uh, I couldn't see. The pain was so intense. Uh, my hand was melded together, and my eyes were burnt. My face was burnt, and. Uh, one of the things that, and I, I was going into shock, and I knew I was going into shock. I was trying to calm down, but I asked my dad if he'd give me a blessing. Rather than scolding me and kicking me out to the road and picking me up the next morning, hauling me out, he, he laid his hands on my head. I recall asking him, Dad, please, please bless me that I will have my sight. That was my biggest fear. I remember that he paused as he thought about things for just a, in my mind it was like three or four minutes, but it's probably only 15, 20 seconds. But anyway, he, he laid his hands on my head and gave me a blessing. And to this day I have absolutely no, no, no effects from that. But what he taught me there was the power of the priesthood. I'm one of those, I thought I was intelligent, but I apparently I had to learn the hard way, but that was one of the greatest lessons that he taught me. I mean, he taught me how to work. He taught me just to work and not complain. But he, he, he really taught me what the priesthood can do. I have been so grateful for that, to have the gospel in my life. I have a strong testimony of our Savior's plan of salvation. I know it's there and I know what it's for. I know that this temporary departure of his mortal body isn't going to be very long, but upon our reunification, that the joy we will have as family and friends is greater than what we can even imagine. My testimony of the gospel is very strong and very deep, and I owe that to my parents. They taught the gospel in our homes, or in our home. I cannot say that I always enjoyed family prayer and family home evening. Being a father of myself, I know what the struggle would, was like to uh, get up for scripture reading and to sit through lessons, but nevertheless they persevered. I was taught a love of learning from them and that I'm grateful for. But I want each one of you to know today how grateful I am for the privilege and honor that I've had to, to be a son of Jean Orr. I couldn't ask for anything better. I love him very much and always will. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I really thought about uh, tugging on a shirt, uh, a shirt or his coat. He would get to over five minutes, but that's all right. Mark. In the Book of Mormon, there's a story about a prophet named Lehi. He was told and commanded him that he, in a vision, that he needed to take his family away from Jerusalem and go to a promised land. Shortly after he left Jerusalem, he had another vision. He had a vision of, of a beautiful tree. He was taken to this beautiful tree And, and Lehi said, And it came to pass that I beheld a tree whose fruit was desirable to make one happy. It came to pass that I did go forth and partake of the fruit thereof. 
And I beheld that it was most sweet above all that I ever before tasted. Yea, and I beheld that the fruit thereof was white to exceed all whiteness that I had ever seen. And as I partook of the fruit thereof, it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. Wherefore, I began to be desirous that my family should partake of it also. For I knew that it was desirable above all other fruit. And I beheld a rod of iron, and it extended along the bank of the river, and it led to the tree by which I stood. And it came to pass that I beheld others pressing forward, and they came forth and caught hold of the end of the iron rod, and they did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron, even until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. And Nephi later says, Wherefore ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and all man. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. If my dad was standing here and you could see him right now, this is what he would tell each one of us. To grab a hold of the iron rod and come to partake of the fruit and to feel the love of Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. And He would want us to press forward and have hope in our lives and to experience the true joy that I know that He has now experienced. I know that He's seen our Savior. I know that more than anything in this life that my dad wants us all to be gathered together as a family in the next life, just like we were in this life. Monday night, I got a call from Jolene saying that dad was in bad shape, that I was going to need to say my goodbyes to him. So they called and I got to talk to my dad for a minute. He instructed me on a couple of things that he wanted me to do. And I told him I would do them. And then he said, please, tell my grandchildren that I love them. <laughs> he told me how much he loved me. See, my dad took me in and raised me. Not being his own, he treated me as if I was his son, biological son. Could not have asked for a better dad to raise me. Dad was not perfect. As you heard some of the stories that were told, he didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of worldly possessions. 
But I can tell you one thing he did have a lot of, and that was love for his family. And for those that he would talk to each day, as you heard from siblings, that he was a great teacher. He was not a great, he didn't, wasn't a, a great teacher of word, but he was of deed. He set a wonderful example for us. One of the greatest things that he gave his family was time. If we needed something, he was there to help us. He taught me to be kind. He taught me to be honest. He taught me to work hard. He taught me to serve others. When we had a service project in the ward, he was the first to sign up. We'd go up to the church farm, even though me and Larry probably didn't want to go, but we would, he would take us up there and we'd build fences. One day we had a, a neighbor that uh, was building a house just up the road. Had a big windstorm the night before that blew that house over. My dad got me and Larry and, and we were about the first ones up there to help. My dad taught me so many wonderful life lessons. And, and most of all, he taught me to love the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never wanted to be better than my dad. I just was hoped that I could be almost as good as him. My oldest daughter, which I'm grateful for, she put a, po a poem on the on, the, on, the, on Facebook that just really touched my heart. I don't know who wrote it, but it truly fits my dad. And called, He Only Takes the Best. God saw you getting, saw you getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. With tearful eyes we watched you and saw you pass away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, hard-working hands to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. There's so much truth to that because in my eyes, he was one of the best. Because he lived a Christ-like life. I have a strong testimony of this restored gospel because of my dad. I know that Jesus is the Christ. I know that we have a loving Heavenly Father that loves us very much. I know the plan of salvation because my dad taught me. And I know that families can be together forever. And I know we will if we will only try to grab a hold of the iron rod and stay on the path that leads back to our Heavenly Father. I know the Book of Mormon is true, and my dad taught me at an early age that it was true. And I believed him. I'll miss my dad.
I thought I could do anything. I am the person today because of him. But when we get to the other side, there's one thing we will not hear him say again, and that is, when we pass the cemetery, we won't hear him say, people are just dying to hang out there. <laughs> and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Brothers and sisters, following my remarks, we'll have a benediction by daughter-in-law, sister Nyla Orr. And I would like to remind you to, if you're headed to the graveside services, please follow the family with lights on to maintain a spirit of reverence and, and love for Brother Orr. I'd also like to mention that Brother Lyman on the stand with me will be conducting the great graveside services. <clears throat> well, if, if today was supposed to make sure that uh, Brother Eugene had a good laugh, at least I was successful in confusing Brother Larry here. <laughs> and, and they've been trying all week long to convince me that this is Brother Larry and, and this is Brother Jeff. So <laughs> I, I'm certain I have it correct still, but Anyway, dear sister Claudia, I love you and thank you for letting me share so much time with you this week. It has been such a pleasure to get to know you and your family just a little bit better. I have really, really enjoyed that and full of gratitude for the great examples and great people that your family is and has become. That is truly the testament of Brother Orr. So I listen to all the stories and all the comments. It's just phenomenal life. Life lived to the fullest. Mortality practiced at the fullest measure. Today holds a significant day with your son Kevin and, and brother and other family members that might be here of Kevin's. What a phenomenal day to share with that departed son. No doubt. He's here, and many other ancestors to share in this sacred exit to the other side. It's wonderful that we can share in, in this meeting with them and commemorate and celebrate such a wonderful life. As I listened, a few scriptures came to my mind, and I'm paraphrasing them. In Doctrine and Covenants 101, the saints are just struggling. They've been driven from Hans Mill and they're under persecution. And the Lord asks them to be patient and calm down. And then he says, be still and know that I am God. We also can be still and know that everything is in his hands, even in thick trial. Later in that same section, Doctrine and Covenants 101, it suggests to care not for the life of the body, but the life of the soul. It's evident that Brother Orr was exceptional at making that choice. A great example to us. <clears throat> Later in the Doctrine and Covenants, when Joseph Smith is experiencing severe persecution in Liberty Jail, locked up, he he asked the Lord, where is, remove thy pavilion. And after a bit of a revelation, the, the Lord suggests, thy days are known and thy years shall not be numbered less. So hold on to thy priesthood and remain faithful. Clearly, again, Brother Eugene taught us to live or was taught and lived that, that suggestion. We have a great, another great example that's phenomenal. I love it. Now, finally, at the end of the Book of Mormon, the Nephites have been destroyed, and Moroni wanders alone and says at the very end, Come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. I think all of us can agree Brother Eugene 
is an astounding example of choosing to come unto Christ and be perfected in him. It has been a pleasure to get to know him and each of you. I love you. Thank you. How wonderful is the great plan of salvation that our Heavenly Father has created and the central role of a beautiful and perfect Savior who gave all for each of us. We are saved by our Savior Jesus Christ as we choose to live and follow Him each day, not walking perfect, but choosing to get back up and try a little bit harder the next day. I know that to be true and a fact. And boy, has Brother Orr just given us a perfect example of how to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear Father in heaven, at the close of this funeral service for Grandpa Jean, we give thee thanks for his testimony, his examples, and the teaching, and for being able to be together and feel the love and support from thee. We are very thankful for the plan of salvation, so thankful for the work and the love of those who have moved beyond this earthly realm, for the love and support that they are allowed to give each and every one of us as needed. We're thankful for the spirit of love and compassion. We're very grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the testimonies that have flourished because of Jean and Claudia and all of the generations of time that will experience the love of Christ in their lives. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the blessing of love and families. We're very thankful for the sacrifice of thy son Jesus Christ for his atonement, for the unity of families. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, will you please rise?